we are excited about that webinar. And what we want to speak about is about communicating complexity when it comes to climate change and migration. And um, why do we think it's important? Maybe yesterday when you saw the news, you saw such things. So a heat wave in India. So that is what we see and what we fear and the way we speak about it is also determining what we are going to do. So our idea is to come down to those processes and to see how we speak about a climate change and migration. So we have the, um, the, the heat wave in India, for example, where you have more than 40 degrees for many for many days or weeks. We have on the other side, and we think that is far away from our Western, Western position, but it is not. If you look at Germany, for example, what we see and what we fear is, for example, last summer in Germany, we see Ahrweiler. We see that we have effects of climate change and we know that will have an impact on migration, but how and how to speak about that? And this is what we are going to talk about. So we want to come away from simplistic thinking around migration because we think this will exacerbate also the negative effects of many sorts. So we're going to, go to speak about complexity and contradictions of the debate. And the goal would be to facilitate, some, facilitate somehow greater complexity thinking on climate change and migration among policymakers, the media, general publics and among us, I would say. So this is what we are going to do in the next hour. And in the meantime, I just let in people. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm happy to introduce into to our speakers, which are brilliant and which are part of the pre-working group um, on climate change and migration. And this is Mr. Professor Robert McLeeman from Laurier University in Canada. He's one of the authors of the IPCC report and focusing on migration. We have Professor Stephen Bertovic from, he's the director of the Max Planck Institute on Ethnic and Religious Diversity in Göttingen. We have Mr. Joseph Taye, he's the director of the Center for Migration Studies at the University of Ghana in Accra. We have Harald Sterli from the University of Vienna and he's working in the Transway project. We have also Dr. Karolina Sikwa from the Hugo Observatory in Liege. And um, we have as commenters, Mrs. Mary McAuliffe. Or Olive. She's the head of the, Migra of the Migration Research Division in Geneva for IOM. And we have Mrs. Dr. Nina Niebeck Sörensen from Dies in Copenhagen. She's head of the research unit Migration and Global Order. How will we do that? How to get the complexity into a form that we all can follow for one hour um, in front of our screen? So we thought it's good to have a Pecha Kutcher format, a style which means that each speaker will show three slides and will speak for a maximum of seven minutes about her or his ideas about the topic. And then the commenters will have five minutes to comment on the papers and we have also some minutes left, we hope, we think, we feel, for questions, answers, and discussions. And um, the speakers will focus on different aspects, on Mr. McLeeman on pressing questions and reports we have. We will have Mr. Vertovic on the dynamics of complexity. We have Mr. Tai on the gender dimension of climate-related migration. We have Mrs. Sikwaf on habitability, so where can we live? <laughs> what you saw a moment ago about the heat waves. And Mr. Sterling on vulnerabilities. The discussions will highlight the main points they see in the debate. And this is the way it goes. I just start the slide for Mr. McLeeman and Robert, please just start. And Thanks, Felicitas. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks everybody for joining us at this online seminar and uh, guten Morgen, guten Tag from, uh, from, from Canada where I've just had my morning coffee. So yeah, just to get us going, I want to talk about some of these bigger issues that we want to, to discuss today. Uh, starting with the general challenge is that, you know, in the research and academic community, we understand migration in the context of climate change to be uh, complex, to be multidimensional multi-causal, 
to be very context specific. There are a lot of variables that come together to shape particular migration outcomes when a given climate event occurs. And yet when we see what's being talked about in the media or in policy circles, it's often simplified uh, to the extent that we feel uncomfortable with the narratives that emerge. So for example, a drought in Syria, people come to Europe and claim asylum. Um, um, you know, uh, um, excuse me, Robert, we noticed that we cannot see you when I show the slides. Okay, so, that's fine. Uh, can you upload your slides then? I'm sorry, I didn't know that. Oh, okay, fair enough. Uh, okay. Yeah. Excuse me. I oh, just no stopped my. At all. How about that? Can you see this? Okay. Yeah. I'm just getting it set up then. So then we can see you, which is much better. Okay. The slide. Are we good? Yeah. Okay. No, great. Not yet. No. Mm. How How about that? That is good. Thank all you. All right. Just Perfect. a little bit of a lag there, Thank I you. think. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, well, I won't do, I won't repeat what I said since I, I think everyone heard me okay. Uh, but uh, again, yeah, so the question, the, the challenge becomes, you know, there's these uh, rather simple narratives that emerge in the media in policy discussions. Drought in the Middle East uh, uh, leads to conflict and asylum claimants in Europe. Uh, weather events in Central America leads to migrant caravans arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border. And yet we know that, uh, that this is more complicated than that. Uh, and so uh, I used to work in government. This is my second career being an academic. So I'm familiar with how governments like to talk and discuss and frame things because they have their own language, their own vernacular, their own dialects, and uh, they speak it well with one another. Um, but not often do they speak the same language that academics do. A simple example, academics like to talk about mobility uh, and use that as a term to, to talk about migration in all its various forms. But to a government person in Canada, at least, mobility means something very different. It means helping people with physical disabilities navigate physical spaces. So when they talk about mobility, they talk about mobility on public transportation or buildings and so on. So there's a language disconnect. So what I want to do is just reflect upon what kind of messages governments understand uh, and in, in this context and, and can relate to. And I'm going to draw on some thoughts that I've taken from discussions I've had with my colleagues who are on the panel, but also I, I just participated in a PhD defense of Nicole Bates Emer, who graduated from the University of Victoria in Canada, and who actually studied it as part of her research, um, how governments and how media frame the climate migration debate. And she did this by looking at media reports and by interviewing bureaucrats and policymakers. Uh, and what she found is that governments like to frame things in terms of disaster response. That's the way they approach this issue. And I suspect it's not unique to Canada based on my interactions with policymakers otherwhere, other, in other places, uh, because every country experiences weather-related uh, disasters. So this brings me to my first slide, which is this is how the government of Canada likes to frame environmental challenges that affect human well-being. Right now, there's a drought in Western Canada. The government learns that it is affecting farmers. And so what do they do? They take action. Typically, in this day and age, they give extra money to farmers or extra uh, services. And then they issue a press release, right? So that's what you see. Drought in the upper left-hand corner and a government news release saying Canada taking action to support farmers. And uh, disaster response. We do this with in the international field as well. Again, there's a global food crisis taking place and it will probably worsen because of the Ukraine conflict. Government of Canada hears about this from the World Food Program, from UNICEF, from UNHCR and others. So they respond typically by giving money, right? So again, disaster response. Governments work well in that kind of messaging space. This presents a twofold challenge for those of us who are interested in you know, the, the effects of climate change on uh, migration and displacement, right? And the, the two, whoops, I'm going to jump ahead uh, to that slide in a moment. But the two challenges are this. One is that climate change and migration is not a disaster res response problem. It's a disaster risk reduction problem, right? I mean, people are being displaced from their homes right now by weather and climate related events. I, uh, the internal, internal center uh, for uh, internal displacement, international, no, internal displacement monitoring center. Sorry, folks, haven't had my coffee at IDMC. 
reported last year that 30 million people were relate, uh, displaced from their homes in 2020 because of weather-related disasters. So yes, people are, are being displaced right now, but the great concern, especially for those, those of us who work in the field, is that that number is gonna grow many fold in coming decades if we don't do anything about climate change. So what we want governments to do is to invest in essentially disaster risk reduction, which is something that the government of Canada, and I suspect other governments, are not especially good at because it's not the framing they like to do. Um, it, people are going to be displaced from their homes in coming years by climate change. Hmm, governments might say, well, let's just wait a little while and see what happens, and then we can send money or respond and so on. The second challenge is this, is that the response itself is a complex one. When we say, what do we want governments to do? We typically want them to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, to invest in building adaptive capacity in low-income countries, uh, to uh, change their migration policies, and increasingly there's discussion around loss and damage under the UNFCCC. In other words, the solution is just as complicated as the problem in terms of communicating it. So that's our real problem. And so my final slide is that it's not all hopeless. Governments are starting to work into this complexity field. So for example, in Canada, again, there's a few things that governments are starting to get. We now understand that we need to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and have made commitments under the Paris Agreement. There's still a lot of talk and not much action, but at least we're talking about it in the right terms. We're also talking about adaptation a little bit more now, which is directly linked uh, to migration and displacement as well. We still talk about it in very simple terms. And typically, how does this, how do we adapt Canadian cities and Canadian infrastructure to climate risks? But we're starting to think in terms of disaster risk reduction. And indeed, we're even starting to see things like emergency preparedness campaigns, typically in response to disasters that have happened at home. We had 50 degrees Celsius temperatures in British Columbia last summer and massive flooding in the same region a few weeks later. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's sort of triggered us to think about this in disaster risk reduction terms, or at least emergency preparedness. And the government of Canada just recently uh, released an adaptation um, uh, report as well last year. So we're getting there. But where we don't, where we're still lacking discussion is, for example, I bet nobody in Canada knows what the Sendai framework is on disaster risk reduction. It's just a, an alien term. I think most government officials don't know what it is. So they don't even know that, and we've signed off on this, right? So they don't even know that this is part of a framework that we, that we should be participating in. We're also not familiar with the global compacts on safe and orderly migration and on refugees, which contain blueprints on how to deal with people who are displaced uh, by weather events and climate as well. So we need to bring policymakers to their attention, these sorts of initiatives and documents that many of them have already signed on to and don't even realize they need to operationalize. Uh, so I think just to wrap up my little bit, I think that's the next step, at least uh, in the context of Western Europe and North America, is to start to edge the discussion of policymakers away from disaster response into disaster risk reduction and to start to realize that in many cases, the policy tools that are needed in a changing climate already exist. How do we get them to embrace it? That's all from me. Thanks, folks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Robert. Our next speaker is Steve. Could you load up your slides, please? Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, Felicita. Um, very uncharacteristically for me, uh, I'm actually going to read uh, a text. That's because I wanted to be concise and so forth. It, it won't sound as nice as, uh, as Robert's um, kind of flowing presentation, but I wanted to be sure to absolutely uh, get my points across and mainly to stick to my designated time. So please bear with the reading. And, but I really want to bring in why we're talking about these issues by way of a, a concept like complexity. So uh, drawing on complexity theory in the natural sciences, there has been much work in social sciences towards developing complexity thinking on a range of topics. Such thinking underlines the need to recognize in many kinds of social developments, the dynamics of multiple causes, multiple processes, and multiple outcomes. And that's what this kind of generic uh, complexity uh, graphic is supposed to represent. 
this represents a move away from so-called linear models of cause and effect. And so in terms of migration, I'm thinking of ideas that poverty causes economic migration, politics causes refugee flows, uh, and to get across the notion that there's actually a lot more to it than these simplistic linear cause and effect models. So uh, first, with particular reference to migration and climate change, such complexity thinking calls for greater attention to the simultaneous, interdependent, mixed, and compound effects of multiple migration causes or drivers. Uh, causes or drivers of migration are seen as multiple because people usually respond and move by way of combinations of at least five sets of reasons, which I'll quickly go through. And I think uh, my friend Joseph is going to talk about these a little bit after me as well. So the first set of reasons involve political causes. This includes issues of state corruption, oppression, and violence. There's also social causes. These include things like family aspirations of how they want to develop themselves and particular members of their family, sending remittances and so forth. There are economic causes of migration. This regards issues of livelihood, inequality, access to resources that also prompt people to uh, consider decisions to, to migrate. There's demographic causes, often stemming from resource competition intensified by population growth or the presence of large numbers of young people who cannot gain employment. And then finally, as we've been hearing, there's environmental causes relating to slow or rapid onset ecological degradation and catastrophe. Complexity thinking entails an approach to such causes as perpetually and mutually triggering, influencing, and intensifying one another. And that's represented by the little arrows here. Now, rarely do we see uh, decisions made solely due to, to one causal factor. Second, in their combination, variable configurations of, of causes uh, directly affect multiple processes of migration. Processes of migration are multiple because they entail developments in at least three different domains, at least three, there's more than this. But A, processes uh, are, include things like the temporality of migration, that is, whether people can decide whether to plan and move as selected individuals or families at a later date, or in sequence, or whether they absolutely must move right now together as a group. Uh, processes are also multiple when they involve variable uh, geography of migration. That is whether and why people from certain parts of a country move and move to certain places within a country, within a region, or indeed across global terrains. These are all part of the multiple processes that unfold. And finally, there's processes around the selectivity of migration, that is, whether a particular migration movement is largely related to a specific social category by way of ethnicity, gender, religion, class, family status, particular localities, as we heard, or combinations of these. These are all factors that, that come together to set off different kinds of migration processes. Third, the outcomes of migration are also multiple. When migrants arrive in a destination country, they are already, first of all, socially and economically positioned differentially through combinations of legal classification, visa regulations, bureaucratic processing, or indeed their lack of papers. So right away, you have a, a kind of array, a multiplication of, of different social positions uh, by way of outcomes. What happens next depends on a constellation of factors. There is no uniform integration process. Rather, integration is a broad concept referring to an array of areas the labor market, housing, education, legal administration, social services, healthcare, language acquisition, and everyday social interactions. Each of these spheres has their own requirements, challenges, and dynamics. One's ability to participate in any one of these areas often itself depends on a combination of factors, including legal status, age, gender, work skills, social networks, education, and training level. So these are just other ways I'm outlining that the outcomes are also multiple. Consequently, there are numerous possible pathways and manifestations of integration that a migrant might follow. Again, there's no single pathway and it depends on an intersection of factors. So another pair of key relevant notions drawn from complexity theories are uncertainty and emergence. And that's what these two little graphics are supposed to represent. Uncertainty 
relates to the fact that trajectories of multiple causes, multiple processes, and multiple outcomes are inherently unclear. They cannot be predicted, be predicted or forecasted, as many state and international agencies would like to do and often call upon academics to provide forecasts and predictions. Emergence is a concept pointing to the ways that new systems arise, often of their own accord, from the complexity of multiple causes, processes, and outcomes. Such emergence organizes new interdependencies of elements of, of people's characteristics and their relationships to their new environments, and it shapes further processes. Here, for instance, this might refer to the ways that specific sets of migrants self-develop new lifestyles, livelihoods, and practices in light of the social, economic, and climatic conditions they experience before, during, and after their migration. We just don't know how people will shape these. Past migration histories are no clear guide, especially under new circumstances like climate change. The question remains, as new systems emerge, how open or amenable are they to intervention, for instance, by government policies? At what time and at what scale should interventions be targeted in light of all of these complex causes, processes, and outcomes? These are key questions that policymakers regularly, regularly need to face. It is urged that they do so with a greater awareness and attention to the entangled complexity at play. Unfortunately, policy quests are often based on simpler framings and a desire for quick fix solutions rather than an appreciation of complexities in contemporary and future developments. I know as an academic, that's easy for us to say because we're not being in those difficult policy decision uh, frameworks, but it's nevertheless our, our job to keep reminding them of, of that. Climate change is notoriously uncertain. We just don't know where, when, and how climate, atmosphere, and weather dynamics will play out. We also cannot foresee from place to place how new configurations of causes will prompt different groups to move at what times, to where, and with what consequences. For those who study global migration, this too represents a set of interdependent systems that are uncertain and lead to their own patterns of emergence. Greater acknowledgement and communication of these aspects of climate and migration are necessary for better public comprehension and more flexible policy, and especially to move away from dreams of prediction based on simplistic cause and effect models. When it comes to thinking about and dealing with the relationship between climate change and migration, the motto should be, keep it complex. Okay. Thank you, Stephen, for that. Thank you so much. So keep it complex, that is nice. And dreams of prediction. And we heard about the existing frameworks. And I now ask Joseph to come up with his view on the gender dimension also. Please go ahead. My slides. Yeah, we can see that. Thank you. Right, so thank you very much. And I want to greet all the participants for making time to be with us. I'm going to talk briefly about something that is very important that has been forgotten uh, in policy discussions. That is the gender dimensions of climate change and migration. Uh, this is something that is very important but has not been well captured in most of the writings, even by academics and let alone policymakers and also the media. So we do know that the impacts of climate change are gendered. So when you go to many communities, especially in Africa, there are gender rules. So men do certain things and women also do certain things. Women, for instance, are responsible for fetching water and fetching firewood for the house. And so when there is climate change, the impact is greater on them. They may be required to walk longer distances than before in search of firewood. And then when it comes to adaptation strategies to manage climate change, we also have gender differences here. And let me also add intergenerational differences in recent years. So most of the times these institute strategies include Irrigation, for instance, which men are able to do better than women. In some communities where you have to use manpower to dig dugouts because there are no planned irrigation systems, women may find it very difficult to do this. 
And also when irrigation facilities and other mechanisms are, are implemented at the household level, they may favor the men at the expense of the women. And this is something that we normally don't hear about when we are talking about adaptation to climate change. The programs are done for communities as though communities are homogeneous, but we have to recognize these gender differences. And then as a result of the fact that it is difficult to adapt to climate change by only in situ uh, mechanisms, migration has become a very useful strategy. But we do know from what has been discussed so far and what we know from literature that migration is affected by an iteration of climate change with different factors. And these different factors are gendered, as you can see on the diagram that I'm showing. You will realize that when it comes to personal factors, for instance, then it is not only the situation that both men and women have the same power to migrate. In some places, the male patriarch may take decision on who to, should migrate. And so in Northern Ghana, Burkina Faso, Northern Nigeria, increasingly, you see that the men will migrate, leaving behind the women. And that is something that we have to recognize in policy issues. But increasingly, some women are also able to migrate on their own. And this is more complex than is presented in the literature, because if you go to some of the communities, you will realize that uh, whereas men largely migrate living behind women, there are some areas where women are also able to migrate. Uh, during the GCM study in the Yellow Krobo district of Eastern Region in Ghana recently, we found out that the family is more likely to allow men, women to migrate than men. Whereas in other parts of the world, is the situation that uh, men tend to migrate living behind women because the men are supposed to inherit uh, the eldership and therefore some families will not want. Also within the global culture, women can migrate in search of husbands that is allowed. And whereas in the Northern Ghana, where women are not really allowed to migrate easily, is the case that usually a husband will have to be found for the woman at home. So what is important is when dealing with climate change issues, we have to recognize the fact that men and women may not have the same ability to migrate. Usually the immobile, those who are not able to move, tend to be women, but there are complexities here to recognize that in some cultural groups, it may also be men. So the women are unable to migrate generally because they lack certain resources, because of also gender roles that keep them at home to take care of the children while the women, the men migrate. But we have to recognize that is not always the case. And that in some instances, women may be allowed to migrate and men are not allowed to migrate. What do we need to know for the purpose of policy? So for the purpose of policy, we need to ensure that gendered issues and intergenerational issues are incorporated in migration policy. Uh, as it is now, that has not been done well. Uh, in the first place, in many countries within Africa, for instance, where climate change is an issue, Migration is not seen as part of the problems, even though we do know that not everybody is able to move. If you look at the media representation of migration, migration is largely portrayed negatively. I see people are moving towards Europe or people are moving towards urban areas. And then we tend to talk more about the negative impact of their migration rather than the positive impact. We do know that migration itself can be an effective strategy for dealing with climate change, but that has not been incorporated. In fact, in Ghana, for instance, there were some programs whereby young people that migrated from the north, where we have climate change and variability impacts greater, have been given some training and they have been given money and they have been encouraged to go back because it is thought that once they are in the urban area, because they are not planned very well for the urban area, their presence is causing a lot of troubles. So if you look at policy, making so far, migration is seen as negative. I think that is something that needs to change. And if that is to change, then it means that the media academics, we need to communicate it better to policymakers so that we highlight both the negative, which are the challenges, but also the positive impacts of migration. We need to let policymakers know that migration itself can be an effective strategy for dealing with some of the challenges that we face. We need to focus not only on those who migrate, but also those that are left behind. And this could be 
the elderly, it could also be women that lack the resources to migrate. We also need to incorporate uh, youth issues into climate change and migration uh, adaptation programs that we are, climate change ad adaptation programs and migration policies that are being implemented. We need to in uh, incorporate youth issues because there are a lot of challenges faced by the youth which are not captured in the current policies. And I think that is something that we can do better if we engage the policy makers and the media. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joseph. You've been perfectly in time. And um, we come back to your topic on the youth and gender, certainly. I now ask Caroline to come up with her presentation, please. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you so much. Um, I will jump right into it. So I want to talk to you about a different angle, but I think that it relates to what everyone else has been saying about these complexities, um, because there's also interrelated complexities, of course. And what I want to do is just kind of show you three images. So my slides might be even more, <laughs> more simple than, than others, and um, that I think speak to some misconceptions we have um, or at least dominant narratives um, that we have about the concept of habitability or the, the word habitability. You know, as Robert mentioned, sometimes in academia, we have a disconnect between uh, what you know, policymakers or journalists might hear or say and what we mean um, or say. And I think habitable, the word habitable or uninhabitable um, is one of those, those words. So, the first image I have here <clears throat> is what I like to call the kind of cracked earth image, right? This is the, I think oftentimes if you just search climate and migration or climate migration in um, your basic Google image search, a lot of the images are going to look like this. This is a lot of the covers of reports <clears throat> of um, or in media and what it gives you the impression, right, is this idea and this way of using habitable that the world is going to become, or parts of the world are going to become uninhabitable, right? And that is going to lead to mass migration. And so this image, right, this vast, you know, kind of wasteland image of um, desertification speaks to that, or these, you know, flood images where a uh, place is completely covered in water. So the idea there being that habitability is really a physical determination. That with climate change, um, migration happens because a place becomes simply uninhabitable from a physical standpoint. And I think that's where we're missing some complexity in, in the way we think about habitability, climate change, and, and migration. Because Habitability is really also a social determination. People don't migrate just because they physically can't breathe, right? Or there is absolutely no water. They migrate because of the impacts on their livelihoods, which is well established on agriculture, on um, any number of, of social, political, economic, um, other environmental or demographic factors. And so when we speak about habitability as this um, physical sense, we really miss that social uh, influence and the fact, importantly for policymakers as well, that a place might become uninhabitable for people re reach a social tipping point well before it ever reaches this kind of physical um, tipping point. So if we're expecting mass migration to happen in the Middle East when the human body can no longer tolerate heat, we might wait too long. People are going to migrate before that and we're not prepared for it. So <clears throat> the next image I want to speak to, you know, another aspect of habitability that maybe we're communicating uh, or miscommunicating is the idea that a place is either inhabitable or uninhabitable. Okay, so migration either is a mass or not. Uh, and that's what we know from the evidence that that's not how it works. A place might be livable, inhabitable for some people and not for others. 
And that, again, that speaks to, you know, also what Joseph's saying that, um, you know, it depends on your vulnerability. It depends on your um, exposure. It depends on things like gendered uh, livelihoods uh, or um, any number of other factors that combine to make maybe a place, you know, inhabitable for me and I don't feel the pressure to migrate um, and uninhabitable for my neighbor. Right. And so if we understand how ability is this kind of um, black and white status, we're missing that nuance, that complexity that we need to treat with policies and with interventions, but also with with our research. Um, so it's not, again, a black or white determination. Again, might be, you know, immobility for might be the answer or outcome for one and immobility for another. Um, so the kind of last point I want to make is, is this idea, too, that migration or mobility is this um, signal that, again, a place has become uninhabitable, right? This is, again, this idea and expectation of a mass migration at the same time. And that, again, that's so what's often you often hear is right, that migration is the failure to adapt. So it's a signal that we've reached like our resilience is maxed out. Um, and now everyone has to leave, right? Again, uninhabitable. Um, but what we have to, again, bring back, and again, this has been mentioned by other speakers, is that when we think about the relationship between migration and habitability, we also have to think about that migration may make places more livable, right? More inhabitable. It may push those limits of adaptation. So sure, in some cases, it may be a signal that something's um, you know, going wrong, but on the other hand, it can actually maybe push those social tipping points by reducing pressure on natural resources or through the kind of well-established mechanisms of social and financial remittances. And so this is here, I wanted to just show you an image uh, where uh, from Comoros, this is from a village called Ikori in, in Gazija, Comoros, uh, where I work. And this village was very clearly a village of migrants. Okay, so the next, you can go to other villages and you'll see a completely different housing structure uh, because Ikuni has a huge number of migrants in Marseille. And so they have much more resilient disaster uh, proof kind of houses than other places. So people then, some people are leaving and that enables the immobility makes Ikuni more habitable than another neighboring village where people aren't leaving. So again, introducing that complexity to habitability that migration isn't good or bad um, universally. It's not always a signal of uninhabitable. It may actually make places more habitable. And with that, I conclude. Thank you so much, Caroline. You, be, you were perfectly in time also, so I just, um, ask the la our last speaker, which is Howard, to come up with his presentation, please. Thank you, Harald. Ah, you okay, will... thank you. Can you, can you see my slides? We can see your slides and we will see that we can put your pin, everything fine. Just yeah, go ahead. Great. Okay, thanks a lot. So um, I'm focusing on uh, um, one of the subtopics of the whole um, non-webinar, um, it's about how climate change, vulnerability, and migration are related. And um, what we can see here is a bit of a um, 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 redesign of the famous um, risk diagram of the IPCC. So what I want to show here is that first climate change can and is, of course, directly contributing to the displacement of people and mobility for example, by rising sea levels, by displacement through sudden onset disasters such as storms and flooding, so where you don't have a choice to go. But things are much more complex than that. Climate change also increases the frequency magnitude of other and of slow onset events, um, for example, of droughts or uh, of just rainfall and temperature changes, increasing variabilities. So that's the left um, wing of this, this uh, triangular stuff. Um, then if people live or if their livelihoods are situated in risky places, um, for example, if um, they depend on rain fed agriculture in semi-arid and dry areas, or if their settlements are situated on slopes, this potentially then exposes people to these kinds of 
sudden but also slow onset hazards. That's the upper, uh, the, the downward wing with the, with the dryland rise here. Um, this becomes then a problem when people are vulnerable. So when they're susceptible to these hazards, um, for example, through lacks of capacity to deal or to cope with these hazards um, or to lack um, of ability to adapt to changing and especially increasing hazards. So vulnerability stems often from poverty, inequality, marginalization, from institutional weaknesses, uh, failure of the states, and from larger patterns of inequity that often have historical rootings in colonialism and in exploitative trade and power relations. So it's these three, the hazards, exposure, and vulnerability that shape the risks that people face and the resulting decline, disruption, or even loss of livelihoods that we can see here in the middle, in the center, or um, to refer to what Caroline was, was uh, presenting, changes in habitability of places. Um, this in turn shapes people's need, aspirations, and capabilities to move or to stay. Sometimes in the form of displacement of whole households, but much more often, that's the key point here, in the form of migration and movement of individuals and household members to support their households and families at places of origin. And this then creates complex feedback loops because migration is not only shaped by vulnerability, but it also influences vulnerability and vulnerabilities, I should say. So um, migration can, and it does, and Caroline referred to that uh, already, right? Through the flow of remittances, financial remittances, but also ideas and innovations, and through the spreading of risks and the diversification of livelihoods, um, contribute to adaptation and improved well-being. But it can also, and it does also as well, results in livelihoods decline, in misery and the production or reproduction of precarity and vulnerability and poverty, both in places of origin as well as destination. So to assess the outcomes of migration on vulnerabilities, we need to consider the situation and situatedness and well-being of both of migrants at places of destination or household parts in places of destination, as well as household or family members in places of origin. We also need to keep in mind, and um, this is also building to what Joseph said, that these migration outcomes are differentiated along existing and intersecting lines of difference and marginalization, such as gender, poverty, class, race, ethnicity, and so on. Um, so what we have here are finely differentiated and, and, uh, and fine-grained patterns of differences, how migration and vulnerability intersect. Um, what then can we say about what makes migration work for adaptation? There are some key factors that we can disentangle here. Um, first is the situative context of the migratory move. Were migrants able to strategically plan and to prepare or were they leaving under time and, and resource pressure? Then the resource endowment of the households at places of origin, are they able to invest remittances in a way that makes them less vulnerable or that decreases vulnerability? Then the living and housing conditions of migrants at places of destination, do they get fairly and regularly paid? Are they able to claim labor and other fundamental human rights? And then also the quality and type of the relation um, between migrants and households of origin. Are migrants socioculturally obliged to care for elderly parents, for example, um, at places of origin? So considering these factors or these, these, uh, these uh, axes of, of uh, influence can help us unravel and disentangle some of these complexities here between uh, in the relation between climate change vulnerability and migration. Um, what then can we do or can be done uh, to make migration work for reducing vulnerabilities or make this better work? Um, from my side, from my view, it's, it would be important to first um, strengthen the capacity of vulnerable people to adapt in situ in places, right? And um, to reduce risks and to reduce hazard. Um, and this then leads to um, the increasing the freedom of people to decide to move or to stay. Um, and second, we should acknowledge that migration has a certain potential um, of uh, contributing to adaptation, um, just considering the sheer amount of financial remittances compared to development aid and blue and red lines in the diagram, this becomes pretty obvious, right? Um, so in a world that's that's uh, very much shaped by by migration hesitancy or a certain um, uh, I would say um, 
um, sedentary bias still, um, it would be important to decrease obstacles for, for migration, to consider migration in adaptation and other types of policies and planning, and of course, to mitigate the negative effects of migration that are obviously also there. And third, to shape the working and living conditions uh, which allow migrants to live in dignity, to thrive, and to support their households or their kin and family members in places of origin. Yeah, that's so much for me. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Harald. So that this is also a strong plea to uh, which directs our attention to the social, to look on the entanglement of the social and um, the climate change and um, to consider freedom of movement, to think of concatenated crisis in a way. I would like to ask uh, Mary now to come up with her comment on the different perspectives we just heard. Mary, the floor is yours. Many thanks indeed, uh, Felicitas, and thanks so much to our speakers and for the opportunity to, to be a discussant today. They have taken us through uh, the complexities um, in a very succinct, I wouldn't say simplified, but a very succinct uh, way and offering different perspectives from gender and uh, demographics, as Joseph took us through, complexity theories, really talking about um, the disconnect between government terminology, which is where I have spent, like uh, like Robert, the first part of my career in, uh, in government circles and how uh, the terminology can be uh, confusing and it can also result in um, misunderstandings between different sectors, between media and between policymakers and between academics and applied researchers, uh, which in its own right, causes additional complexity. And then we heard, of course, also from Caroline about the um, complexities around habitability and how we think about that and how that's conceptualized uh, in academia and in research. And also from Harold in terms of not thinking about this as linear and also a zero sum game, but looking at the complexities right the way through what I would call a kind of migration cycle, uh, right the way through from movements, but also in terms of uh, transit and destination countries as well and summed up that you know very succinctly and beautifully for us one of the real challenges is and i think it's worth underscoring that this framing of complexity is incredibly important and sometimes i think policymakers certainly in my experience and i'm sure robert has has felt that too can become overwhelmed by the complexity uh, complexity is incredibly important though for policymakers because it enables us all collectively to better understand the issues that are affecting communities, but also to be able to craft effective and underscoring effective responses. This is particularly important. Uh, when we're talking about migration and mobility, including uh, human displacement, it's incredibly important for policymakers to be able to avoid unintended consequences. So while policymakers very often are trying to improve the lives of people around the world, they are trying to safeguard communities, provide opportunities, what can occur is unintended consequences, which can actually cause problems or additional problems or different types of problems for communities, uh, including their own. However, the question that arises for me is, because complexity can be very overwhelming, and in certainly um, my undergraduate degree actually is in communications, and you are taught very clearly when you're going through kind of media uh, training and so forth to simplify narratives and to simplify messages. So that's built into the DNA of how the media um, cycle and the media community works very often, not completely, but very often. Uh, that's what it's built on. But how can we use a simplified entry point to motivate people to learn more about the complexity? And here I will really point to Felicitas's um, introduction as one example in terms of how we can get to that simplified entry point that will spark people's thinking, that will make them want to learn more about the complexities. And that is really in relation to 
not thinking about the scale of mass migration, not thinking about those projections that we hear from various partners, the foresight work which Steve, you know, took us through and, and really how uncertain the environment is and how difficult that is, but policymakers really always call for that. But to think about it in terms of a different cut around data, I'm a demographer, so certainly someone who uh, enjoys rummaging around in data, but thinking about how we can look at, at the moment, in real time, the IDMC's latest uh, global report on internal displacement, for example, look at the 2020 data that Robert mentioned, and we can see if we compare the data that IDMC presents internal conflict displacements in 2020 occurring. Let's not look at the numbers of people affected, that's a different story, but if we take a different cut and we look at the number of countries affected, 42 countries affected by conflict displacement internally. And if we look at disaster displacement, disaster displacement, of course, being related to hurricanes, to wildfires, to floods, as Felicitas uh, mentioned in Europe, then we get a different cut. We can see 144 countries around the world affected by uh, disaster displacement. And of course, very recent events only weeks ago uh, in Southern Africa, uh, recent events all over the world, as you mentioned, in terms of India, slow onset, acute um, uh, events. If we take that particular construct, which is a very simple construct, and look at that in terms of the number of countries affected, it becomes much more real for all of us. It's not like, as Robert talked about, Canada looking at disaster risk reduction for other parts of the world. That will be Canada looking at disaster risk reduction for its own people, its own communities, as well as for other people, because we're all in this together. So complexity can also give us hope. Complexity can show that disaster risk reduction means that there is a way of actually mitigating some of the climate change impacts. Complexity can also show us, as um, uh, Caroline mentioned, in terms of habitability, that it's not a zero sum game. That technology, for example, can be determinative in regards to the boundaries and stretching the boundaries of habitability. I did travel to the Gulf uh, in early March this year and I was struck by the weather, which was, it was almost uh, 40 degrees very early in the year. And thinking about this is potentially our future and the use of technology has expanded the geography of uh, human settlements. And, and maybe this is what we will be looking at around the world in different parts of the world. At the moment, it's the Gulf, but it can be extended into different parts of the world with uh, not just disaster risk reduction, but the use of technology to really soften and push those boundaries around habitability. Mm -hmm. So let me leave you with that. Let's, let's think about complexity as giving us a sense of hope. Complexity is giving us a sense of potential empowerment at the local level, at the community level, and trying to really enforce that and really, I guess, underscore that rather than enforce that, but underscore that in policy circles to be able to ensure that the next COP is one that is focused uh, on complexity, that is focused on effective solutions and draws on the wealth of uh, science and data, research and analysis, particularly when it comes to migration, mobility and human displacement as it relates to climate change impacts. Thank you, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Maui, for this insight and this question. How can we use a simplistic entry point to enter into the complexity of the of what we see? And our last commenter is Nina, and I'm so pleased to have her here as the last person to speak because I, we know each other since a long time. And I always appreciated your very critical view on things going on. So please go ahead. Well, thank you very much to Felicitas and uh, thank you to the panelists for allowing me to uh, take part in this uh, very exciting uh, and important uh, dialogue. Um, I would really like to congratulate the, the panelists uh, for, for bringing uh, these questions of how to communicate the complexity and how to facilitate complexity thinking forward. Uh, I mean, in various ways. Uh, Robert McLeeman, um, by, by showing which climate change related questions that are taken up 
by whom and for what purposes, but also which questions remain underrepresented due to their potential politically contagious nature, of which, as I understand your slides, a comprehensive and just global migration policy remains the largest challenge. So it's there on the table, but very difficult to talk about. Stephen Wurzowiec, uh, for drawing attention to uh, the need to recognize multiple causes, processes and outcomes uh, of, of clima, uh, climate remate, uh, related mobility. And I think um, your call to move away from linear models is to a large extent met in many contemporary research efforts, but it remains a challenge, however, that governing institutions and policies not cope easily with complex causality and surprises and uncertainties, as, as you mentioned. And perhaps we could discuss ways to include issues of power and political authority into this complexity framework. Who can speak about what from which platforms? Um, at least I think uh, that could move forward uh, the discussion. Uh, Joseph uh, Taye, uh, I think, um, really contributes uh, by underscoring that the complex and context specific relationships between and among gender, climate change and migration uh, is, continues to be, I would say, important. But so is um, uh, attention to other social inequalities uh, and personally, I'm currently engaged in those related uh, to age, as, as, as Joseph also mentioned. And I think that given that all over the world, children and youth are feeling the effects of unprecedented intensifying, and in some instances, even irreversible uh, climate change, we need to know more about what they think. What does it mean to grow up in, in, in developing countries, particularly um, vulnerable to, to these changes and with gloomy prospects uh, further nurtured by the latest um, uh, ICCP report, um, some will be forced uh, to, to relocate, others will be trapped or unable to move. And even for those uh, with more choice, I mean, it will sort of uh, really be important for the kind of futures they envisage for themselves and where that future is likely to have better uh, prospects. Um, Carolyn uh, Singgraf's presentation on the complexity of inhabitability, uh, inhabitability, it's a great word, by the way, I think adds important thinking uh, material to this particular question of which futures people can imagine. Um, um, and, and I also think it provides a, a concrete conceptual framework applicable to, to many contexts. But again, it remains a challenge how to engage policymakers in dialogue, for instance, with children and youth, uh, with women, with other um, um, disempowered groups, and understand how their perceptions of local climate change impact on where their lives may intersect with their aspirations for better futures for who they want to be and or want to become or simply for thinking that it is possible to survive. Finally, I think that Harold uh, Sturley's um, multi-directional uh, analytical model represents a very productive way to visualize complex causal relationships, uh, but also the role of governance in climate uh, related mobility outcomes. So given all these very valuable um, contributions and your emphasis on the potential in migration playing not just a problematic, but also a positive role, I sometimes wonder whether it is more research on mobility patterns and responses that we need or do we also, or at least additionally, also need more research on uh, which factors are taken into account by whom? I mean, uh, how uh, policy making uh, is not just 
a question of treating a problem but sometimes also a cause. And of course, what concerns me here is the lack uh, uh, of dialogue in between those engaged in climate change impacts and, and, and adaptation and mitigation uh, efforts and those engaged in migration management control, whatever. Uh, I mean, this lack of communication here, maybe we should study that to a larger extent than has been uh, the case. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. And I'm, I'm absolutely excited about the comments also. And of course, the lack of interdisciplinary discourse we see and transdisciplinary discourse, as um, Maui was saying this, is a major point why we want to bring together the scholars here and which we do with the pre-conference process of, of Metropolis also. So I want to thank all the speakers. I want to thank also those uh, who commented, of course, those who have um, written their questions into the, into the chat.